gonna hit you. They want to drink Merlot, we're drinking Merlot. No, if anybody orders Merlot, I'm leaving. I am not drinking any fucking Merlot! Okay, so joining me uh, this evening is uh, the wonderful Alexander Payne, whose film uh, The Holdovers uh, you've you've just watched. Uh, welcome, Alexander. Thanks a lot. Always fun to hang out hang out with you, Neil. Cheers. Thank you. Uh, so I'm going to start by asking um, <clears throat> the origins of of the of the story, really, because you've said in interviews about um, the Marcel Pagnol film um, Malouse. Uh, was a kind of starting point, but then also David Hemmingson, who wrote the screenplay, his pilot as well. So if we could just talk a little bit about that, please. Yeah. First of all, have you ever seen Merluse? I haven't, and it's it's one of Pagnol's I haven't. I've seen most of his, but it's about 35, is it? 36? Uh, yeah. yeah. Somewhat, okay. <laughs> somewhat autobiographical to his up upbringing in Marseille. Uh, so I caught it at the yeah, excuse me, it's early in the morning here in, Los, in uh, Omaha. Um, I caught it at the Telluride Film Festival about a dozen years ago. And I walked out of the movie, th movie theater thinking, what a good idea for a movie. And I would like to see an American version of that or something. So I, I, I don't even remember the story very much. I only saw the picture once, but I, but the basic premise stuck with me. And so it was on my list of like good film ideas, but I didn't do anything with it. At least I hadn't. I was meaning to get around to it one day to go to some of those New England boarding schools and do some research because that is not my world. I'm not from that part of the country or from that ilk. Uh, but uh, then about five or six years ago, I received out of the blue a pilot screenplay, as you say, for a, uh, a proposed TV series that would take place in a boarding school. And it was really well written. And a light bulb went off in my head. And I thought, oh, I'm going to give this guy a call. And maybe he can sort of could be a collaborator <clears throat> or get this uh, screenplay up on its feet. So I did. And he agreed. It turned out he liked my movies. And we had a really rich collaboration. I gave him the premise. He took it. We decided upon a year in which the film would be set. And then we hashed out a story together. He proposed, you know, three, four, five different possible storylines. I selected one. We started, you know, then just a, a long, long dialogue. Who the characters are. Uh, he would write portions of the screenplay show them to me you know I, you get the idea just a big back and forth I would rewrite parts and send them back to him and we wound up with a screenplay that we were both happy with and and actually what's lovely is the quite personal to us both so I've been hearing a lot of uh, questions like oh you're not credited as the, as the screenwriter but it so has your your voice in it whatever that is whatever that means and I when I describe the process it makes total sense yeah yeah, no, it does. There's definitely elements of you, particularly in some of the jokes and uh, some of the some of the dialogue as well. Yeah, um, how I mean, how was that different? Because you've worked with Jim for so long as well on so many different projects. It was just you just you know fancied doing something. It all just fell into your lap, and it was something a bit different. Well, look, are the Wilder pictures different different with Bracket from how they are with Diamond? True. You know, yeah. There's, there's still, and and think of all the Italian directors and Japanese directors who never wrote alone. They always had, if not one collaborator, many. You know, so many great Italian films have four to six people credited in the screenplay. I would, I that would be such a neat thing to kind of explore, like what those were. You know, there's, uh, there's uh, Dario Argento's name on Once Upon a Time in the West. Yes, yeah, true. <laughs> Yes, yeah. And, uh, uh, with, with, with Bertolucci, Bertolucci, I think he's in trouble. Suzo Cecchi D'Amico and so on. Anyway, yeah. so it just worked out that I've often worked with Jim. Now I worked with David and I'm now going to continue to work with both on different projects. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so casting next, I guess, is uh, the key one. And uh, it must have been lovely to, I know you've been looking to try and do something with Paul again for for a yeah, while. I, wanna, I sort of want to do everything with him. <laughs> yeah. Well, 
why wouldn't you? <laughs> why wouldn't you? And then um, Divine Joy Randolph as well. I think I'd seen her in, was it Dolomite? I think um, um, the, the Netflix, yeah. And the big discovery of of Dominic as well. And um, that's a big and, uh, one. This this little idiot kid will soon be making much more money than I. <laughs> yeah, quite possibly. Yeah, quite possibly. But he was um, he was a real discovery. And I know you'd even texted me actually when you first started doing this about did I know any young actors that might fit the fit the yeah, bill? I did mention sure, a couple. Right. I, I was getting desperate. Yeah, <laughs> but you know this. This kid, he was he was incredible, and first time in front of a camera, and uh, you know, it's so so natural in his performance as well. Very He's really talented. It's a it's a big discovery. He's yeah. really talented. I had had some uh, talented teenagers in previous movies, you know, notably Reese Witherspoon in Election and Shailene Woodley in The Descendants, but they already had accrued quite a bit of professional experience and they were both clearly going places my film just helped them a bit my films just helped them this guy Dominic Sessa really is as you say it, it genuinely that word really applies discovery mm, yeah no no for sure um the oh, film just style in case, you're, in sorry. case you're sorry just in case you, our mm -hmm. viewers our friends don't know uh he was an actual senior final year at the high at one of the high schools at which I shot the film and that's where we found him in the drama department there yeah and is is that something he's now going on to pursue in terms of oh my uh, god are you yeah, kidding yeah. me oh Jesus <laughs> what is it? out of your mind of course he is <laughs> loving life but he was already in his final year of university he was yeah. already applying to I'm sorry final year of high school he was applying to colleges to universities to study acting Carnegie Mellon in Pittsburgh and New York University and so forth. And he put in a year and a half at Carnegie Mellon, which is a really esteemed uh, conservatory. But now he's like getting offers and he'll get back. He actually wants to transfer schools. But anyway, he's going places. Yeah, for sure. Um, the filming style. Uh, I know you have a big love of 70s um, American cinema any, anyway. And uh You've shot it with that with that complete look, even down to the credit sequence at the beginning, and so on and so on. Um, I wonder, did I mean, although you shot it digitally, did you did you think about was there any thought at all about shooting it on film initially? Of course, or, yeah. Oh okay. hell yeah, of course. I I miss shooting on film. I don't fetishize it, but I miss shooting on film. And if not this one. Which, you know, what, what other movie would you possibly want to shoot on film than something that you're trying to replicate uh, an actual a film made actually in 1971? Yeah. But the the cinematographer and I shot tests on film and digital and uh, took both to the uh, digital intermediate house to the post-production coloring facility. And the, what we saw was that the amount of treatment we were going to have to do to the image was so uh, complicated in a way that it the, the, the source wasn't going to make a hell of a lot of difference, whether it be film or digital. So yeah. for economic purposes, uh, we wound up shooting digitally. Yeah. Um, but I can tell you something, the, the illusion that it was shot on film is really complete when you watch a film out of the, I mean, most and probably your cinema too, you've been showing the DCP. Well, we did strike some 35 millimeter uh, prints. And when you see it projected, then the illusion really is complete. Yeah, okay. I, I will, no matter how cool the, the image looks, I still, you know, I miss film projection. Even more than what we shoot on, I miss projection because flicker is superior to glow. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Movie Movies are meant to flicker. Sure. No, I <clears throat> completely agree. Um, I understand as well you showed the cast, well, not, not the cast, some of the crew and and uh, Dominic, some movies from uh, the period uh, sure. that you were wanting to set the film. Could you just talk a little bit about that and which, which ones you showed them? Yeah, well... I do that anyway before any movie I'm making. In the weeks of pre-production, every Wednesday, I have a some kind of screening party, either at my house, if it's the house I'm renting and the location area is big enough, 
or I'll make friends with a local cinema and pull prints and show them there. Uh, and we do it every Wednesday night and it builds good esprit de corps among the crew. And, you know, each week there are more people there. You know, the suddenly, oh, the accountants are here and oh, the <laughs> transpo guys are here. And uh, well, but in the preparation period of this film, it was even more important and it told me more specifically what to screen. And I very pointedly uh, selected films from late 60s and early 70s. Not that we were trying to emulate any single one of them, but just so. I mean, in as much as we weren't, I kept telling my collaborators, we're not making a period film. We're making a contemporary film set in 1970 and pretending that we're working then. And I think that had a very positive effect on the aesthetic of the film. It's not glaringly or cartoony, uh, glaring or cartoony in its presentation of period. Uh, so anyway, what did I screen? Uh, the Graduate, oh, Dominic Sessa, the kid. He had never seen any of these movies. So I wanted him to get a sense of the texture of the films we were trying to, to be a part of. Oh, The Graduate, oh, Hal Ashby's first three movies, The Landlord, Harold and Maude, The Last Detail. Uh, what did we watch? Paper Moon, uh, Clute, The Conversation. I wanted to show Nashville, of course, but we couldn't find it. Or we ran out of time or something. But anyway, it was very helpful for, for, for Dominic. And then just as a lovely reminder to, to the cinematographer and production designer and uh, costume designer. Yeah. <clears throat> um, music in the film uh i mean that was um i mean i always i've said to you so many times so over the years i always love the scores for your films but also the use of the use of songs and uh this one was just almost on another level um in as much as uh you know the use of some of the songs in there was just absolutely fantastic and uh i know that you know they can cost sometimes a fair chunk of the budget but uh, I mean, how did you go about, um, because of the period, obviously you had, you know, an incredible um, array of stuff to choose from, but um, how did you go about sort of, you know, nailing that down? Well, first, the use of music had many forms. Uh, period songs, which we're using as score. Period songs, which we're using as things that the characters are actually listening to in C2. Period music, period, not songs, but like uh, the Von Trapp singers and uh, the Swingle singers used, you know, typically doing Christmas music and using that as, as score. And then we, uh, there were secretly in there a couple of contemporary songs used as score. And then we had original uh, music composed by one Mark Orton, who 10 years ago had done my film, Nebraska. And look, I'm blessed to have, we're kind of a triumvirate in the uh, editing room as to music. Myself, Kevin Tent, who also has a very good sense of music. And we have a terrific music editor who really does much more than that title implies. He's London-born music editor named Richard Ford. And the three of us have been doing the music for my film since election. You know, we've been working together for 25 years. So, so it was on this and we, you know, you nothing new. You just go through the film during the entire editing process, continually slapping songs on or pieces of music to see what works. And then you, then you start to find out what are these things going to cost? Are they even clearable? I.e. can you find the artist to get his or her permission? <laughs> Like yeah. sometimes you can't find them like they, no. you know, or the, there's a rights issue. Well, there's a right for that song was sold to so-and-so was sold to so-and-so. And now we don't know who has it, that kind of crap. And the, first, if you can track down the right, the rights holders, and then if you can afford it. And then I did have to go back hat in hand a couple of times to the financier to juice up the music budget a little bit, notably Cat Stevens. Yeah, Cat Stevens was a big ticket item in this one. And I tried to replace it. You know, I tried to find something else, you know. And I didn't want to be accused of trying to be like Carol and Maude and putting Cat Stevens in there or whatever. But it just worked so well. 
Yeah. And I just kept thinking to hell with it. If I were making a film then and that I knew of that piece of music, I'd try to use it then. True. Yeah. yeah. Oh, um, by the way, it, hold, hold on. Don't go away. Okay. We even put out the soundtrack album on I uh, it. yes i do have it <laughs> it is it is, it is lovely yeah it and then we made, we made the soundtrack album have as accurately as we could the feel of a soundtrack album put out in 1971 yeah i love the artwork the artwork's great <laughs> yeah. it's really good um a final question uh alexander is you said i think in an interview quite recently um that uh Obviously, when you're making the film, you you see it so many so 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 many times through the editing process, uh, so that you know you kind of know it inside out. But then once it's released and into the world, you've kind of said you then don't really know it at all. That you then don't really know it at all because Correct. so many people come and say they see things in it that you hadn't even perhaps contemplated. Well, I look, guess yeah. that's true with, with a lot of people's work. So. Yeah, I, I think that's true. What I'm making in the process of making the film, I'm the one who most knows what it is or should be or can be. And then once I've finished it, I'm the one who least knows what it is. Yeah. I can't, Maybe for a couple of reasons. Maybe it's like when you say a word over and over and over again, it becomes literal nonsense. It doesn't mean anything to you anymore. Uh, also, you know, on kind of a larger philosophical level, it doesn't belong to me anymore. Yeah. You know, it's, it's not mine. It belongs to the no. viewer, as yeah. it should. Yeah. As it should. And then, so when I get in certain interviews and they try to pin me down, like, well, why did you do this? And what's the theme of that? And what's on it? And it's just like your other movies, you know, the disgruntled white male, you know, middle-aged <laughs> trying to move his way through life. Like, I don't know, leave me alone. I, don't, I, you know, just enjoy the movie or not. And I just make them. And, uh, but the coda of this, the description of this phenomenon is that if I don't see the film then for, at least six years, then happen to look at it, then I can get a sense of what it is. Yeah. Like, oh, I see what they're talking about. You know, or oh, I, I was going through that in my life at the time and it showed up or you know, something. Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> um, thank you very much uh for that. Um, I don't know whether I can keep this bit in or not, or whether you can answer it or not, but what's next? Are you I'm I had a feeling you said know. to me. You don't know, okay. That's no, I, I look forward to, I mean, I, right now we're, we're speaking <laughs> February 8th, 2024. So I'm balancing personal life, you know, a, a child in Greece and my 100 year old mother here in Omaha. And I'm still on the kind of promotional uh, hamster wheel of the film and, uh, trying to keep up with emails and, you know, it's kind of yeah. all of this to suggest that I look forward to having a calm to get back to writing. Sure. But one thing I'm very interested in doing somehow within the next two or three films is a Western. I've been yeah. really dying to, do, I've been dying to do a Western. Sure. Okay. Well, thank Thanks, you very yeah. much. Always good to thank hang out with time. you. Always good. Thanks for uh, the interest, everybody. Cheers. Thanks for joining me.